Good evening, and welcome to the Sunday evening service of Port Norris Baptist Church in Port Norris, New Jersey. I'm Pastor George Riddell, and we're delighted that you have joined us this evening. I trust it'll be a profitable time for you spiritually. I trust as the Word of God is shared, that it'll help you to come into a closer walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know Him as your Savior, I trust that you would come to know Him as your Savior. And uh, if you are saved, I trust that it'll help you to grow and to mature spiritually. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 with me, if you would. Excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and beginning at verse number 10. 2 Timothy 3, beginning at verse number 10. We're going to be looking at verses 10 through 13, though we will not get through all of it tonight. The Bible says this, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So, Father, bless, I pray this thy word. Help me to be a blessing and encouragement to these dear and precious folks. Help the word of God, Lord, to strengthen them in their walk with you. And we'll thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Paul is uh, once again encouraging Timothy to live a godly life. A godly life under very difficult circumstances. Timothy is pastoring the church of Ephesus. The city of, I, of Ephesus, as you know, was a city given over to the worship of uh, uh, Diana, the goddess, a false god, a myth of man's imagination. But nonetheless, they were given over that wicked and vile idolatry and immorality. Idolatry and immorality go hand in hand. <clears throat> and so here young Timothy is. He's in this city with all this wickedness around him. And uh, these are really difficult people to pastor. They're, uh, they're difficult people to be able to minister to. And so Paul is trying to encouraging, to, uh, trying to encouraging Timothy by letting him know, you know, Timothy, you've watched my life. You've seen everything that I've gone through. Now you can go through it. And all that will live godly will go through trials and will go through difficulties. So how do we live a godly life in ungodly times? How do we live a godly life in ungodly times? Well, look at verse number 10 of 2 Timothy 3. Notice what Paul says to him. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience. Hath fully known. Luke writes in Luke chapter 1 and verse number 3, he says this. It seemed good to me also, having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first. Perfect understanding, uh, Luke writes. What's, what's he mean there by that phrase? He means the same thing that Paul meant when he said fully known. It's the idea that you have closely watched, you have observed very closely, you have closely traced the pattern of that life. In other words, what's Luke talking about? Luke talking about, he's talking about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's talking about, Timothy, you've seen my life. You've seen how I've lived. You've been with me on preaching trips and preaching tours. So I want you to understand, Timothy, there's the power of preaching in an individual's life. But our preaching is reinforced, not by what we say. Our preaching is reinforced by how we live. You see, <clears throat> it's a sad commentary when Christians say one thing, but absolutely practice another. It's called hypocrisy. And Paul writes to Timothy, and he knew Timothy was struggling. He knew Timothy was in a difficult situation. He knew these people of Ephesus, you know, the majority of them would not respond to what Timothy had to offer and what he was preaching and what he was teaching. But Paul simply says, I want you to know something, Timothy. It's important. Look at my life. You've observed it. You've traced it, if you will. Look at my life. And... Be assured that as God has brought me through, and, uh, and, and uh, that's what he, 
uh, talks about that the Lord has uh, brought me through this and he will bring you through it as well. Uh, in verse number 11, at the end of verse number 11, he says, but out of them all, out of all of these things, the Lord hath delivered me. Out of all of these things, God hasn't left me. He didn't abandon me. He didn't leave me there by myself to fight my battles. The Lord has delivered me out of all the difficulties, the afflictions, the persecutions, the heartaches, the trials, and the burden. If we look at Acts chapter 20, beginning at verse 17, we see the following. Paul is calling together the Ephesian elders. And the word of God says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable to you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is emphasizing to Timothy the fact that, you know, Timothy, you've known my life. You've known I've faced obstacles. You know that I've faced heartaches. You know that I've faced uh, trials and difficulties. Um, and yet Paul goes on and he says uh, to Timothy that you have known fully uh, my doctrine in verse number 10. Timothy, you've known my doctrine. Now, let me hasten and say this. Doctrine is extremely important. Some folks uh, would say, well, doctrine is not that important. Doctrine is all important because doctrine is what we believe. What do we believe as a church family? That's our doctrinal position. And so doctrine is fundamental and it must be the basis of church fellowship. You can't have a church membership made up of people that believe all sorts of different things. If you're going to have a church, a oneness in Christ, then it must be based upon sound doctrine. Some people base their Christian life on experience. And let me just say this to you. Experience is never the basis for our Christian walk. Experience never is what we need to use as how we live our life because experiences come and experiences go. There are times when I experience happiness. There are times when I experience sadness. So I don't base my walk with the Lord based upon me being happy or being sad. I base my walk with the Lord and my conduct in life upon doctrine. What does the word of God have to say. So Paul is saying to Timothy, he says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine. You've watched my life. You've seen me. You've observed me up close and you've seen how fully I have tried to trust the Lord and to walk with God. And so Paul says, once again, Timothy, be aware of my conduct, how I conducted myself. You see, Doctrine controls our conduct. Doctrine, what I believe, controls my conduct. My belief system controls my conduct. In 1 Thessalonians, as Paul writes there in chapter 1 and beginning at verse number 5, it says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only. In word only. In other words, it's one thing for a preacher to preach another thing for the preacher to live it so Paul writes to these Thessalonian Christians and he says for our gospel came not unto you in word only but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake and ye became followers of us and of the Lord having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost in other words, he's saying to the Thessalonian Christians exactly what he said to Timothy. He's saying, 
You know my life. You know how I've walked with you. You've observed me. You've been able to see what I have done, how we've lived. You've seen the power of God in us. You've seen the Holy Spirit use us. You've seen us preach with much power and much assurance. And he goes on and he says, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. Paul says to the Thessalonian Christians, we were careful how we lived among you because we knew that you would be observing our life. And we wanted to make sure that our life reflected the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Christian, hear me when I say this. As a preacher preaches much more with his life than he does with his words. What do you mean by that, preacher? If my walk, no, let me back up and say it this way. If my talk is not backed up with my walk, my talk becomes absolutely meaningless. People would look and say, well, Pastor Riddell doesn't believe what he, what he says. Look how he, look how he lives. <clears throat> he, doesn't, he doesn't live carefully. He says whatever he desires to say. He doesn't control his spirit. He doesn't control his words. He doesn't control his life. He doesn't let doctrine interfere with his lifestyle whatsoever. So a preacher not only preaches verbally, but a preacher preaches with his life. If a preacher is going to have any credibility, any credibility, credibility is built on truth. Credibility is built on trust. If you don't have truth and trust, you have no credibility. So if a preacher is going to have credibility with those not only inside of his own church, but those inside the town, then his life must be reflective and his walk must be reflective of his life. So we teach, and that's not only preachers, that's deacons, that's Sunday school teachers, that's choir members, that's just members of the church. We teach people two ways about our walk with the Lord. Number one, with our words. And number two, with our life. Over in Acts chapter 16, <clears throat> if you would turn there, Acts chapter 16, and look at uh, verse number 24, well, Acts chapter 16, and beginning at verse number 16 through 24. Acts 16, beginning at verse number 16. We see this uh, young lady with the... Uh, uh, demon possession. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her master much gain by soothsaying. In other words, her demon possession in this, uh, in this young girl, her master who owned her would make money off of her. The same followed Paul and us and cried saying, these men are the servants of the most high God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought, unto, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded them and commanded to beat them. In other words, there's chaos at this point. All because Paul and those who were with him cast the demon out of this young girl, and all of a sudden, this man who was making money off of her miserable life off of this life that this young girl had to live because he was her master. He's not making any money. Well, now he's upset about that, and he reports Paul and the others uh, to the magistrate, saying, These men, they trouble us. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast, fast with st in stocks. So... 
Here's Paul and Silas. They had been faithful in preaching the word of God. Here they had done a good thing in alleviating this girl's pain and anguish that she was experiencing. They had, they had cast out this demon. Now the man who had owned her is all upset because his money-making machine is gone at this point. He stirs up the magistrates and those in authority. They get all upset. They have Paul and Silas beaten and Paul and Silas thrown into jail, all for doing that which was good. Now, how would you and I react in a situation like that? Remember what I said just a few moments ago? We preach not only with our lips, but with our life. And Paul and Silas would be a good reflection of this. I mean, Paul and Silas really could become somewhat bitter, somewhat anxious at this point, somewhat angry, somewhat mad. Why? Because they were treated unfairly. They had done a good thing. This girl had a miserable, miserable life and apparently a very wicked master as well. And so because they cast the demon out and this man no longer had a money-making machine, they end up getting beaten severely and cast in the prisons, in the inner prison, in stocks. I mean, it's cold, it's damp, it's miserable, it's smelly, uh, and it's just terrible conditions. Remember, I said to you, we preach with our lips and with our life. So let's just see how Paul and Silas reacted. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. <clears throat> and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So at midnight, what are Paul and Silas doing? Are they arguing? Are they angry? Are they upset? Not at all. Not at all. The Bible says, first of all, they prayed. And folks, when we're facing hard times, and we're living in hard times, that's the first thing you and I need to do, is to pray. We need to be prayer warriors. We need to be men and women that know how to get a hold of the throne of Almighty God. We need that. So Paul and Silas, they're praying. No doubt their backs are bleeding. No doubt there's blood on their clothes and this sort of thing. Infection could possibly set in. All sorts of difficulties. But at midnight, Instead of being angry or upset or saying ugly things to the guard of the prison, they're praying. And then it says, and sang praises unto God. So they were not only praying, they were singing as well. What a testimony. How to live a godly life during hard times. They were unjustly accused. They were treated wrongly for doing something that was good. And here they are cast in the prisons, hurting physically, but spiritually they are rejoicing. And so here, here it is, they're praying and they're singing. And then notice, the Bible says, and the prisoners heard them. Now when you and I go about our daily task, how do we reflect Christ? For example, how do your coworkers see Christ in you or in me? How do they see it? Do they see people that love the Lord? Do they see people that rejoice in the things of God even when things may be going against us? Even when there may be difficulties and heartaches and trials? even when maybe our boss doesn't treat us fairly, or maybe somebody gets a promotion ahead of you or me when we've earned it and they didn't, or somebody else got a raise and really didn't work nearly as hard as you or me and, and you didn't? Do we go around grumbling about our boss? Do we go around complaining about our job? Do go around saying unkind things about those that are in authority over us? Or can we go around rejoicing in, number one, we have a job. Number two, we're able to work. Number three, we're able to earn a living. We're able to pay our bills. Can we rejoice in that? 
What do your co what do your coworkers and my coworkers see when we're not happy with the situation in which we find ourselves? How do they see us react? Do they see us react in prayer? Do they see us react in singing? Or do they see us grumbling and complaining and whining and criticizing and running down? Let me tell you something right now. These prisoners that heard Paul and Silas, they were impressed. They were impressed. I'm sure they couldn't believe their ears because they were in a similar situation as Paul and Silas. Now, maybe some of them were guilty of wrongful doing. I don't know. But what I'm saying is, they had to be impressed because they were in jail, they were in the dungeon, and they could hear these two men praising God. Now, notice what, is, what happens there. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prisons were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, not just Paul and Silas, all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loose. So the doors to the prison, all the prison doors were open, all the prisoners were free at that point. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. All of them stayed. Those prisoners that were basically free at that point and could have run, didn't. I wonder what kept them there. Do you think maybe the Holy Spirit of God kept them there? This, this Philippian jailer saw the doors open. He knew what the penalty was. He was just going to lay his life down. And so in verse number 30, this prisoner now, he had heard Paul and Silas singing, praying, this sort of thing. Then the earthquake comes. The doors are open. The prisoner's chains are cast asunder and, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. By believing, all would be saved. In other words, he had to believe and his wife had to believe, his children had to believe. Individual belief was necessary, but if they would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, his house would be saved. What a testimony. Unjustly treated, beaten, thrown into jail, all for doing good. Paul and Silas praying and singing the doors are open, the locks are cast off of every, uh, everyone in the prison. The other prisoners do not escape, they stay there, and the Philippian jailer gets saved. Over in Acts chapter 20, another portion of scripture here, we teach by our word and by our life. Acts chapter 20, and uh, uh, the word of God speaks about in verse number uh, 18. Um, well, let's go over to uh, uh, verse number uh, uh, 23, uh, 23 and following. He's talking about the fact that he's been warned by the Holy Spirit of God now that if he goes to Jerusalem, Paul, if he goes to Jerusalem now, is going to end up in bondage. And in verse 24, he says, But none of these things move me, neither count on my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Then down in verse 27 it says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And so the apostle Paul had preached there for three years, and he ceased not to preach and teach every day for three years. And he looks at these Ephesian elders and he says unto them, you've observed my manner of life. I realize now that as I'm getting ready to take this journey, you're not going to see me again. This is our final farewell. This will be the last time we'll see each other on earth. But I want you to know, I've not only preached to you with my lips, I preached with you with my life. And uh, in verse number 35, he says of that same text, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of our Lord Jesus is more blessed to give than to receive. And that's exactly how Paul conducted himself 
among the Ephesians. He coveted no man's silver or gold. He simply served the Lord, preaching the word of God consistently. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Bible says the following. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 1, it says this, where Paul writes and he says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Over in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul talks uh, to the Thessalonian Christians. And in verses 1 through 12, and you can read that for yourselves, he's talking about how we as Christians ought to live and how we ought to walk. Remember, we not only share Christ with our lips, we share Christ with our life. And uh, in verse number 10, Paul writes, he says, your witnesses and God also, how holy and justly and unbelievably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. In other words, Paul says to the Thessalonians, same thing as he says to Timothy, same thing that he had said to the Ephesian elders, you know my life, you've seen my life, and you know how we've conducted ourselves among you. We've tried to conduct ourselves appropriately in a godly manner, in a godly fashion. And he says, and you know how we exhorted and, con and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. So Paul repeats himself to different groups. And he said, I want you to remember how we've lived, how we've conducted ourselves. So let me encourage you, look at your own life, ask yourself, Am I reflecting Christ, reflecting Christ not only with my words, but with my life? You're in a workforce. How do people see you week in and week out, day in and day out, month in and month out, year in and year out? How do they see it? Do they see somebody that lives consistently before the Lord? Doesn't let the negative things or the office gossip or whatever have you create a fuss and a stir? doesn't allow the discontent maybe of other employees to create a sense of discontent within themselves is that is that how they see you they see me do they see us above all else that we are christians that is christ ones we name the name of christ do they see us living a consistent godly holy life before the world I hope that they do, because folks, the only testimony some Christians will ever see, or some people will ever see of Christians, the only Bible some people will ever read is your life and my life. We have within the power, not only of our tongue and our lips, but of our life to point people towards Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I do pray that you would bless us even now. Lord, I pray that you'd save that soul that's nearest hell. I pray that there'd be those who would say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I need to be saved. I ask you to come into my heart to save me from my sins. And Lord, I pray, even as I pray often, help me to be the Christian that my wife needs, my children need, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren need, and our dear church needs. So, Lord, help me to walk with you and to reflect Christ at every turn in my life so that others may be pointed towards Calvary. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.